1 Samuel chapter 3. I do also ask you to pray for Jake and Kelly Awerda. And uh, we had a, uh, an emotional uh, memorial service yesterday. Their little uh, baby Isaac Dean, who was, ended up being stillborn, their very first uh, child. And so continue to reach out to them in the days and weeks to come. And uh, they, they uh, are very uh, readily willing to testify of your love and, and church, how you have reached out and cared for them. Let's just continue to do that at this time. I, I'm going to preach for the next several Sunday mornings uh, some topical uh, messages, uh, kind of getting us ready for the new year. In February, we're going to launch into a new series on Sunday morning, and so we'll get to that. Uh, but uh, uh, this morning, I want us to focus on our relationship with God's Word as we enter a new year. And uh, our relationship with God's Word is so easy to neglect. It's so easy to let it slide. And, uh, and I want us to look at that. I want us to see from God's Word what happens when we do and, uh, and some ways to uh, avoid that. And so and look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 3. Look at verse 1. And if you'd follow along as I read, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And we know how Samuel came uh, to the temple to be uh, to, to serve and so forth. We know of Hannah and Elkanah and all that transpired there. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And uh, another way we could say that was the word of the Lord was scarce. Uh, it wasn't, uh, wasn't readily available. Verse 2, And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep that the Lord called Samuel, spoke to Samuel. Uh, of course, in our day, he speaks to us through his word and uh, this was the equivalent of God's word. Word. Uh, he speaks to us uh, from that still small voice of the Holy Spirit uh, in leading and guiding, but, but all truth is in his word. And so, uh, so he speaks to us through his word, and that's what he was doing to Samuel. And Samuel answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli. He wasn't really sure what he was hearing, uh, who was calling him. And so he ran to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. And then the third time, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. Yet you have to give little Samuel credit for being obedient and for uh, having a good attitude and spirit about it. And uh, just, just each time getting up and running in and saying, Eli, here am I. Uh, for you called me. And Eli perceived finally that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee, thou shalt, uh, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. I like that. He went and laid down in his place. You know, it's when we're in our place that we can hear from the Lord. It's when we're in his will and in the place that he has placed us that we can hear from the Lord. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, speak, for thy servant heareth. And so uh, the fourth time was a charm. Finally, uh, Samuel was ready to hear from the Lord. He, he knew what he was listening for. He understood who it was that was calling I like the passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 1. The Bible says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. 
and be more ready to hear. And so we need to be ready to hear God's word. We need to be prepared to hear God's word. And yet at this time in the life of the nation of Israel, they were at one of the lowest points nationally that they'd ever been. Uh, we're just coming out of the period of the judges and the book of Judges is just two books before 1 Samuel, uh, Judges, then Ruth, then 1 Samuel. But chronologically, uh, Ruth was taking place during that same time frame. And so they're at one of their lowest points as Judges closes and the book of 1 Samuel begins. The days of the Judges records in two different places that, uh, uh, that there was complete chaos in Israel because everyone was doing that which they thought was right in their own eyes. Uh, they were just doing what they wanted to do. They were doing what they thought uh, was the right thing or the good thing or the acceptable thing. And uh, in fact, the entire book of, Ju of Judges closes with this sad statement. If you want to turn and uh, look at Judges 21 and verse 25, the Bible says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And uh, that is what led to the low point politically, spiritually, in every other way for the nation of Israel. Now, it, it's interesting that there was no king. Uh, they didn't need a king. If they'd, have, if they'd have made God king and if they'd have followed him and followed his leadership, uh, it, we lead into this is where they ask for a human king and they get Saul and then later they get David and uh, it ended up being uh, a good thing under David. David's reign, but, uh, but everyone doing whatever they want to do never works. It does not work in a country. It does not work in any organization. It doesn't work in a, in a church or in a family. And uh, an organization, a, a, a country needs a unity, needs direction, needs uh, guidelines and organization to it. And, and so uh, this mentality, though, uh, of doing everybody doing that which they thought was right had created a self-inflicted famine in the land. Uh, it's recorded in the book of Ruth. Sometimes famine in the Bible is a time of testing and pruning of God's people. Sometimes you and I will go through a season of famine uh, in our lives and God uh, could be testing us or pruning his children. But in other cases, famine is a judgment from God for his children's continued disobedience to him. And that's what we see here in the book of Judges in there in their case, their rebellion had caused a famine, not only of food, but also a famine of the Word of God. Uh, they weren't having anything they needed, and especially they weren't hearing from God uh, like they needed. Notice back at verse number 1 of 1 Samuel 3, the Bible says the Word of the Lord was precious in those days, and uh, very precious. In fact, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll continue. Father, help us this morning as we look in your Word. And Lord, we want uh, your word to be precious for the right reasons to us. Uh, we want it to be an important, central part of our lives, of our homes, of our church, of our families. And uh, Lord, we don't want it to be precious because it's scarce and because we don't, uh, we don't acknowledge it and don't appreciate it. And so, Father, help us this morning as we close out a year and we enter a new year. May uh, this be a year that we lift up uh, your word and be an important year in our relationship with the word of God in Jesus. Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now notice again in verse 1, the word of the Lord was precious in those days. And certainly God's word is the most precious thing uh, that you and I have as believers. Uh, it should be very valuable to us. Uh, it should be very important uh, to us in our lives. Uh, I know God's word is the actual words that, that we have, but, and it's not necessarily the pages and the leather that binds it. Uh, but I think when God's word is precious to us, uh, we'll even respond.
respect and care for the physical book because we understand the words that it contains are precious words and important to us. I knew a preacher one time who would never place any other book on top of the Bible. He made sure if it was on a desk, if he was carrying it somewhere, uh, God's word was elevated to the very top uh, position. And I think uh, there, that's a good practice. I think that's a good philosophy. I think if we treat the physical Bible, if we teach our children to treat the physical Bible uh, with the preciousness that it warrants, I think that will simply translate to how important the words are to us. And, and so uh, treat God's word as the precious thing that it is. I, I'm also a little old school. I'm reminded more about that every day in ministry. I, I'm just from the old uh, school and the old way of doing things and and uh, and uh, so to me uh, I don't want to let digital Bibles take the place of the old black book now I'm not uh, I'm not against them by any means and I think there's value to them I study in my office over at the other campus other property uh, on a computer and it's very good to get uh, get other resources and to, and to get the, by the the outlines printed and God's word put right in the outline, uh, but as technology advances, uh, there'll be even some who use a tablet maybe for their outline, but oh, I want to always be in the habit of carrying the old black book uh, to the pulpit and, and honoring the preciousness of God's word, and let's make sure that we realize that, the preciousness of it. One of the powerful verses in Psalms tells us what God thinks about his own word. Take your Bibles, go to Psalm. 138. Keep your spot here in 1 Samuel. We'll come right back to it. But look at Psalm 138 and verse 2. Look what God says about his word. He said, I will worship uh, toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. And oh, how we ought to praise the name of Lord. Uh, his name is a precious name. His name is a wonderful name. Uh, and, and yet look what he said. He said, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Uh, it, and the psalmist was telling us that uh, the Lord has magnified his word even above his name. And think about the magnitude of that statement. We know his name is above every name. And yet he lifts his word above, higher than his name. To understand the preciousness, the value of anything, we look at basic economics or supply and demand. And I think the main reason the Bible says there in, verse, uh, in those verses in 1 Samuel that the word of God was precious in those days is because not just the fact that it's infallible and inerrant, uh, not just the fact that it's the perfect words of God, Reserved for us here in the in the Word of God in the King James Bible, but even more so, it was precious in these days because there wasn't much of it available. Uh, they couldn't just go down to the Bible bookstore and buy one. Uh, they didn't have several copies in their bookshelf at home or in the office. It was it was not available. God was not speaking. In fact, in verse one, notice where it said there was no open vision. What that means is God was not speaking to prophets. He was not speaking during this season, during this period. Things had gotten so far from him that he just was not speaking. Uh, certainly he wasn't speaking to Eli. Uh, Eli was so far away from God, uh, he didn't even recognize. God didn't, when God wanted to get a message to the priest Eli, he spoke to the little child Samuel and, and said, Samuel, deliver this message to Eli. Eli, and so in Amos, I, I love this passage, Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, uh, the prophet said this, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but a, of hearing the words of the Lord. 
And oh, what a dangerous day that is in any time in history, especially our time in history, if there is a famine of hearing God's Word, a famine of reading God's Word, a famine of being able to, to take in and feast on the very words of God. And I think we're having a very similar famine in our day. And uh, <clears throat> I think one of the reasons maybe God was not speaking at that season is because obviously they weren't listening. Uh, they weren't interested in what God had to say. Uh, they, uh, they, and I think we have a similar atmosphere in our day, even among Christians, even among believers. In fact, some of their reasons in the, in the book of 1 Samuel, the book of Judges for neglecting God's word, I think are some of the same things that cause people in our day to neglect God's word. And again, remember Ecclesiastes 5.1, be more ready to hear. Hear. Oh, we ought to be ready to hear. We ought to be eager to hear God's Word. We ought to be hungry to read and listen to and hear God's Word taught and preached and read. It ought to be something that we're hungry for in our day. And so let me give you three things real quick that we get from the passage that I think are also true in our day. And the first one is this, uh, the reason that they were not hearing God's word. The reason uh, God's word was precious, the reason there was no open vision, uh, some reasons why there was a famine in the land of the word of God. And, and the first one is this, because people were doing their own thing. Remember, we look back in Judges, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And can I remind us, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so if we live life by the compass of, I'm going to do what I think is right, we're going to end up in tragedy in our homes, in our, in our, uh, our personal lives, in every area of life. But when we realize God's word is the guidebook, God's word is is my guide uh, for life and we line up with his word uh, we'll be on the right track but but in that day they didn't want to know what God had to say they were too intent on doing that which was right in their own eyes and we see they didn't want God's word they didn't they didn't want to hear something different than what they wanted to do they didn't want to be corrected uh, from where I'm going to where God wants me to go and, and so they just ignored it. They didn't want to hear it. Uh, they were doing their own thing. By the way, in these last days in which we live, uh, we see, if we're not careful, a kind of a similar, a similar spirit and attitude. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse number 2. We'll show it on the screen there as well. Uh, Paul told Timothy to preach the word. It was important in their day and it's important in our day that the word of God is preached and the word of God uh, goes forth. He said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, be consistent with it. Uh, boy, don't have those big ups and downs, those big swings of e emotion or those big swings of, of consistency. Just be in season, be steady, out of season, just be steady. Oh, Sunday school teacher, just steadily preach and teach the word of God. And over time, being consistent in season, out of season, God's word will do a work in the hearts of those children and those adults and whoever it is that God's called you to teach and to preach to. He said, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. All of those are in the context of preaching. Uh, we reprove, we teach it again, we rebuke. Sometimes the preacher has to step on some toes. Uh, we, we exhort, we encourage, we lift up, we edify the people of God with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, in verse 3, when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
Uh, they, they, won't, they don't want it. They won't stand for it. They, they won't put up with it. They will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, after their own desires, after what they think, the way they think it ought to be, uh, the way they think it ought to go, uh, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they will turn away, shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And I will say this, even though as Paul wrote this, 2 Timothy, he's talking about the future uh, for the time will come. I, I think we're living in a day where the time has come, uh, and I think we fully realize that. I got to thinking as a pastor and as a leader of, of a, a gospel preaching, Bible believing church and, and ministry, uh, what do you do? Uh, when, when God's people get to a point uh, where they just kind of are not interested in what God says because, of course, we've got all the other voices out there that we're listening to. What do you do? The only thing I came up with, just keep preaching the truth of God's Word. Hey, just keep preaching it and just keep teaching it and just keep doing uh, what we're called to do so that those who want it and want to hear it have some place to get it, but there's a big problem in their day and a problem in our day. People are doing their own thing and don't want to know what God has to say. I think there's a second problem, both in their day and our day. The second problem was because the shepherds who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders who were supposed to be the ones teaching and preaching and organizing uh, the ministry so that God's word was primary and so that God's word was, was the important, was being taught. Uh, they weren't feeding the flock. They weren't preaching the word. Certainly Eli wasn't. Uh, Eli wasn't even hearing from God, let alone able to preach or teach uh, anything. He, he finally gave Samuel some, a little bit of good advice when he finally, after the third time, realized this is God trying to speak to you and said, here, go back. And when he calls again, say, here am I, uh, and uh, your servant is here and listening. Uh, and so uh, Eli wasn't doing it. I, I like what Ezekiel, another prophet, gave a rebuke uh, to the shepherds in Ezekiel 34 and verse 2. He said, Son of man, uh, God said, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. And he wasn't talking about the physical shepherds. He was talking about the spiritual shepherds, the spiritual leaders. He said, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds. Hey, God speaks to the preachers and God needs to speak to the teachers and the spiritual leaders in order for us to speak. He said, woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Now, it didn't stop there. There's certainly nothing wrong uh, with, uh, with a, 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 a pastor or a leader taking care of his own family and, and doing that. But he said, should not the shepherds feed the flocks? And so what he was saying was, you're, you're, you're at the, at the uh, you're not feeding my people because you're feeding. At the expense of feeding God's people, you're feeding yourselves. In other words, you're taking everything for you. You're, you're taking all the time for you. You're taking all of that and you're not feeding the flock of God. And that was a problem. That was a problem in their day. That can be a problem in our day. Feeding the flock means feeding them from the Word of God. Oh, that's why every service, we're going to get God's Word out, and it's not just going to be one verse, and then I'm going to tell you my thoughts and my opinion. Man, we're going to look at God's Word. We're going to cross-reference. We're going to study. Uh, we're going to look at it, and we're going to make sure that we're being fed from the Word of God. There is a dearth of Bible preaching going on in our country. Churches are more geared toward entertainment than Bible preaching preaching and Bible teaching, and that's a problem. It's a problem when the church service consists of 40 minutes of entertainment and 15 minutes or 20 minutes of preaching. Uh, we've got that a little bit out of sorts, and, and we believe good music is important to edify, to prepare our hearts uh, for the Word of God and to receive the Word of God. It's important to help us to worship uh, the Lord, but it does not take precedence over the importance of God's Word being taught and God's Word uh, being preached and God's Word uh, being received. 
In fact, the Bible needs to be the main course. I like what Peter challenged pastors to do in 1 Peter 5 and verse 2. He told pastors, feed the flock of God which is among you. Feed them. Feed them spiritually from God's word. Boy, let's get away from some of the fluff and let's just get down to the business of getting fed uh, with the nutrients of the word of God. He said, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by, in other words, taking the leadership thereof, uh, taking that on you, and that sometimes can be a heavy thing, but taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, not because you feel like you have to, uh, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, uh, not, not for money, but of a ready mind. Uh, oh, we've got to get back to God's Word. Well, we've got to make sure we're teaching it in every Sunday school class. We have over 70 different classes on two different properties in three different languages. And boy, we, we work hard to make sure that everyone who stands before uh, people of any age, any, uh, any area of life is making sure we're teaching the Word of God uh, to them and feeding them uh, the Word of God. Uh, we've got to get back uh, to where the Bible is the main course and all the other are the appetizers leading up to the main course. How many of you have ever sat down to eat and by the time uh, the main course came, you were so full from all of the other stuff? Uh, I remember, I, I think Andrew was telling me, or, or oh, no, Brother Crumley was telling me, he and his wife went out to a nice, uh, nice uh, steak dinner and, uh, and the, the appetizers were great and, and Mrs. Crumley was kind of filling up on those things and Brother Crumley was saying, hey, the steak is coming, the steak is coming. And uh, that's the way it is with the preaching of God's word. Uh, I think sometimes we fill up on all the other stuff and we're neglecting the word of God and that's what we need to make sure uh, that we do. We've got to get back to where God's people are not only uh, are not being fed, not only being fed the word of God, God at church in your Sunday school classes. Oh man, get involved in an adult Sunday school class at 10 o'clock. Uh, get involved in those uh, things with your children, your teenagers, but also to where God's people are feeding themselves seven days a week. Look, you're going to shrivel up and die spiritually if the only Bible you get is here at church. I mean, that's like the icing on the cake. And as important as it is, it's even as important, more important, that we're reading God's Word for ourselves on Monday morning and on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Parents, how vital it is that we teach our children the Word of God that we help create in them a lifelong appetite for, for feeding on the Word of God and not just look in the beginning days a mother bird has to feed the baby chicks but there has to come a day where the baby birds have to mature and have to realize the importance of feeding themselves and so our children have to come to the place teenagers you've got to be at the place where you understand the importance of God's word for your life and for your spiritual health and for your future and for yourself it's important to you to, to read the Word of God. Oh, that's the primary goal of our children's ministry, of our youth ministry, of, of any ministry we have with young people. It's to help them to, to adopt that lifelong habit of pursuing the Word of God and their relationship with Christ and their, and their engagement and activity in the local church. And so how important that is. And, and they had a problem in their day and, uh, and sometimes we can have a problem in our day where the shepherds, the preachers, the spiritual leaders, the teachers just aren't feeding the flock the word of God. And then lastly, uh, and this ties in because they were uh, busy doing what they wanted to do, sometimes we get too busy with lesser important things for the most important things in life. And by the way, that's a lifelong battle. 
of, of juggling, of adjusting, of prioritizing, of, of scheduling. It, it is a lifelong uh, pursuit of trying to make sure that we're keeping the main things in our lives, the main things, the main spiritual things. And can I say God's Word has to be right up there at the top. Uh, it's got to be the main thing in our life, and, uh, and we've got to make sure that the way that we live practically, the way that we organize and structure our life uh, attests to the fact that God's Word is of primary importance. We do that by how much time we spend in it personally. Uh, we do that by making sure Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night is a priority to hear God's Word. And, and, so, and so we need to make sure of that. I could ask you, and, and you, would, you would know the answer, uh, which is more important, God's Word or television? Uh, I, I could ask you, you'd, oh, we'd all say God's Word. What, what's more important, God's Word or social media? We'd all say God's Word is absolutely not even close, hands down, God's Word. Uh, we can live without the TV. We can live without social media. But Matthew 4, 4 says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We can't live without God's Word. We certainly can't live a healthy spiritual life uh, without God's Word. And so uh, I could ask you what's more important, God's Word or talk radio, whether your uh, guilty pleasure is, is political talk radio or whether your guilty pleasure is sports talk radio, uh, whichever it is, uh, which is more important. Man, we'd all say, preacher, that's, that you don't even have to ask that question. It's God's Word. Well, then let me ask you this. How does the time that you set aside for these things, how does that paint the picture of which is more important? I, I heard a preacher one time say, I, I can tell you what your priorities are by just letting me look at your checkbook. And what and that'd be a little invasive, wouldn't it? Uh, let me just look at your checkbook. That preacher said, I can tell you what your priorities are, where you're spending your money. Uh, where your treasure is, the Bible says, there will your heart be also. And that's your priorities. But we can also tell you by how we set up our schedules what our priority is, uh, what we spend our time on. You know, our time is the most valuable resource that we have in this life. We can make more money. You can't make any more time. When, uh, when uh, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And so all of us have that appointment. By the way, some of you that are a little, have a hard time getting to appointments on time, you won't miss that one. None of us will miss that one. We'll be right on time for that appointment when God's timing is. And, uh, and so time is valuable. Where are you putting it? Where are you investing it? Are you spending that time in the Word of God? And, uh, and I, think, I, I think very reasonably you can, you can have a healthy relationship with God's Word in about 30 minutes a day. And, and some do more than that, obviously, and should. But, uh, but how important that is. How many of you, I don't have my phone, I always leave it in my office on a, uh, when I'm preaching, but they got a new thing now. That, that tells you your screen time. Anybody have that? Anybody? How many have just turned that thing off because it has discouraged you so much? And uh, that's pretty eye-opening. Pretty eye-opening. You ought to look at that. Hey, how much, how, much, how much I read my Bible today and how much time have I spent on social media today? And then answer the question, which is really more important? And I'm just saying, it's so easy to get caught up in things that, that aren't of spiritual consequence, that aren't of eternal importance, uh, that in the grand scheme of things, really, and, and we can enjoy, they help us to enjoy, they enhance our life, and they help us connect and things like that. But when all's said and done, uh, we, you know, uh, we need to make sure God's Word, the lesser important things of life are easy to do because they draw us in. Most often they appeal to the flesh and not the spirit uh, 
And we know from the Gospels that the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so the flesh always has a tendency to cave uh, to those things. While the most important thing in life, the one book that will change us and change our marriages and help us in every area of life is so easy to neglect. It's so easy to neglect God's word that will make an eternal difference in us and through us. It's so easy to neglect that uh, because of immediate, short-term, immediate gratification of the flesh. And let me say this too, and I'll be done. I'm closing out and we got to get done. But uh, it, it's not easy to, when you make a decision to get serious about God's word, it's not easy uh, the devil will fight you every step of the way because he certainly doesn't want that. Uh, and it's not easy to get in God's Word and really read. Uh, our attention spans have become so shortened by the media, uh, multi and, and social and, and video and all that, uh, that it, we, we just don't read anymore. We have a hard time sitting down and staying with it. And if you're going to get something out of God's Word, you have to sit down and you have to relax and you have to stay with it and you have to be in the moment. You have to let all the cares of the world fall away and you have to get in God's Word. That's why the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, uh, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A workman, because it is hard work. It's hard work to study God's word. It's hard work to read God's word. It takes discipline. It takes, uh, it takes that. Uh, and, and I, I want to just say all that and we'll be done. How about making this new year the year of lifting up God's word in our lives? How about today just determining, just deciding that God's Word is going to be more important to me this year <coughs> than it has been. It's going to take a more prominent spot and place in my life than it did last year. It's going to be a higher priority. It ought to be the highest priority. It ought to be, I've heard preachers say, no Bible, no breakfast. Certainly no Bible, the TV's not coming on. No Bible, the paper's not coming out. Uh, certainly put it at a priority in our lives. Uh, and uh, wherever you are right now in your relationship with God's Word, let's just take it up a notch next year. Let, let's just take it to a ne the next level. If you're not reading it at all consistently... And I think you're in good company if that's you. That's, that's, it's a difficult thing to do. And don't feel bad about it. Let's just get in a routine. Let's at least set up a daily devotional time. Let's just at least make it a priority that every day I'm going to get God's Word out and I'm going to spend some time, whether it's starting out at 10 minutes a day. When you think about the grand scheme of things, it is, a, it, it is an offense to God that we won't spend 10 minutes a day in His Word. Uh, as important as it is and how beneficial it is. And we ought to grow from there. If you're doing that, but uh, for some, maybe this year ought to be the year you completely read through the Bible and get on a, a program where you read through the Bible completely this year. For others, by the way, teenagers, you can do that. Teenagers, you can read through the Bible this year if you would carve out about a half an hour a day and read the Bible. You can read it through systematically this year. For others, commit to really studying God's Word. Now, that's going to that's gonna be a different level. You can't do that in a half an hour. That's going to have to be where you set some quality time aside. Uh, we set our quality time aside for everything else but God's Word. And so it takes setting down some quality time and spending it in God's Word and studying. And then for even others, let's commit to teaching someone God's Word this year. Well, let's commit. I've been taking in for, for 20 years. Maybe it's time that you teach a Sunday school class this year.
Maybe it's time that you take what you have received, that God has been good to you, to whom much is given, much shall be required. Maybe this year is the year where you say, you know what, I'm a little intimidated, I'm a little afraid, I'm a little, I'm a little scared to do that, but I think I have the responsibility spiritually, and I think God is speaking to my heart that I need to be involved in teaching the most important words that we have in our lives lives the word of God and I think God will bless you hey there might be a famine in the land in general but let's make sure it's not true in our homes in our personal lives in our church in our ministry let's magnify the word of God this year